Hello everybody, this is a live extreme weather briefing. First, we're focusing on the severe weather threat, a relatively conditional tornado threat this evening and overnight across North Texas into southeastern Oklahoma. And then a more substantial storm system ejects across the southern U.S. next week. It looks like Dixie Alley on Wednesday could even have a tornado outbreak uh, if the, the current forecast models are even remotely accurate. Uh, but first, we will discuss the North Texas tornado threat. You can see that target area. And even though I've indicated that it looks like the severe weather should develop around 4 or 5 p.m., it is relatively conditional. And I'm going to talk about why that is a little bit later on. There is some very subtle ridging aloft across the, the North Texas target area. So even though a low-level jet does increase uh, dramatically as we get closer to sunset and the models are uh, indicating bands of isolated supercells to develop across Northeast Texas, maybe beginning initially near the DFW metro Metroplex just prior to sunset and another mode of uh, severe storms uh, should develop along the front as well into Oklahoma and uh, on this target area I do expect a couple different modes I expect storms to develop up here across southeastern Oklahoma into far northern Texas first and then as we get very close to sunset I expect these renegade supercells to develop out ahead of the front in the prefrontal open warm sector. That's as the HRRR is showing. It looks like that's probably going to happen at around 7 or 8 p.m. And those uh, will evolve over a couple hours after sunset before they finally do begin to weaken. But you can see this moisture is streaming northward ahead of this system. And in fact, the parent storm system is still off the coast of California. That's the one that's going to bring a potential tornado outbreak to Dixie Alley on Wednesday. But well ahead of that storm system, there is some moisture uh, return from the Gulf of Mexico. Mexico as a subtle low-level jet uh, has developed and I'm of course going to break down the reasons why I think that this outbreak is conditional or why this severe weather event is conditional and also we'll discuss uh, the uh, 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 the ingredients that are going to be coming together for the Dixie Alley event next week and here is that target area for Wednesday this is the uh, zone that I'm watching very closely uh, for Wednesday. My plan is to depart tomorrow uh, for Dixie Alley as it takes a couple hours to get there uh, from the Denver area. But look at this storm system. This is the one that's uh, off the uh, coast of California. It's going to surge across uh, the southwestern U.S., bringing some snow to the mountains of Arizona and New Mexico as it ejects. And this is looking forward to Wednesday uh, afternoon. So this is the system right here, has a subtle negative tilt. There's that trough axis right there. Usually these banana-shaped upper-level storm systems are the most substantial across Dixie Alley. As you get this large zone of difluence in the upper levels, and you get a very broad warm sector, a big uh, low-level jet, robust, that uh, covers the whole entire warm sector. And that usually means that at least across large sections of that warm sector, you're going to get photographs that are favorable for even a strong tornado threat. And this has been happening all winter long so far with these southern stream systems. That's because we have a weak El Nino in the tropical Pacific, and that has energized the subtropical jet or the southern branch of the jet stream across the southern U.S. That causes the, any storm system that develops in the polar front jet stream to dive south across the western U.S. That brings a lot of precipitation to the coastal ranges and the Sierra Nevadas. And then they will move across the southwestern U.S., eventually ejecting across Dixie Alley. And we also have this semi-permanent anti-cyclone over the subtropics there, as often forms. And then between the troughs that arrive to the west and that anti-cyclone, that's when you get a big-time low-level jet that pumps that moisture northward from the Gulf of Mexico. The GFS is already showing mid to upper 60s dew points by Wednesday. So as we get a little bit closer to that event, the short fuse model guidance is going to ramp up that instability and all the ingredients uh, will be coming together for a potential tornado outbreak, a multifaceted tornado outbreak, likely uh, storms developing late morning first across southeastern Texas, southwestern Missouri, and then as that elevated mixed layer spreads uh, north and east across the warm sector, isolated supercells, many waves of supercells will likely develop across Dixie Alley. But first we have to get through today's setup and I want to bring back the 500 millibar pattern for this afternoon and this is why I do believe that it is just a little bit conditional uh, this severe weather threat uh, this evening usually I start with the upper levels to see what kinematics I have to work with what upper level support this system over central and southern California that is the big weather maker next week that's going to eject across the southern US eventually into Dixie Alley on Wednesday it is going to take its time you can see the subtropical connection here, the southern branch, which usually exists a little bit higher up 
uh, than the northern branch of that jet stream, jet stream. But that is creating cyclonic curvature at the base of the trough, and that causes the trough to continue to dig off to the south uh, into northern Mexico, eventually into Texas. And that's why you get the severe weather threat downstream into Dixie Alley across portions of southeastern Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi, and the lower Mississippi River Valley when that happens. But this evening, you can see just some subtle anticyclonic curvature aloft in the jet. And usually that will act to suppress the development of supercell storms across the warm sector. And that's what it's going to do for most of the day. You just have slight subsidence across the warm sector, but you do have this anticyclone off in the subtropics. You have very generally cyclonic curvature across the U.S. right here to the west of that subtle anticyclonic curvature. And that's exciting. A subtly low-level jet across the southern plains and that's going to continue to transport moisture northward and eventually as we get closer to sunset uh, a couple of those storms could break through the cap and tap into that convective instability aloft and there could be some supercell storms that try to drill down to the surface and even produce a tornado threat as we get close to sunset and likely a little bit after sunset there but that system over california we're going to be watching very closely and i'm going to be heading east to dixie alley tomorrow to position for Wednesday's tornado threat. There is a chance we're gonna bring the rocket launcher and the sensors out there to try to deploy some hardware into these storms. Uh, but again, things are coming together a little bit uh, at the last second for this setup. Here you can see the low level jet later on today. And so even though we do have uh, that anticyclonic curvature aloft, the main Vortmax is lifting up toward the upper Midwest and there is a low level jet uh, residual low-level jet across the southern plains. This is at 850 millibars, the HRRR forecast for 6 o'clock this evening. And this is the western edge of that low-level jet. Not a very tight gradient. And the reason why that is is because the storm system is still off to the west uh, in, the, uh, in the southwestern U.S. And in fact, it's over Colorado right now. There is some subtle ridging aloft. And the squeeze play between that anticyclone in the subtropics and the approaching upper level trough to the west is just not substantial enough to generate a huge low level jet. Closer to that subtle wave that's slipping up, lifting up towards the southern Great Lakes, you do have uh, a tighter gradient on the western side of that low level jet. And as we go to just after sunset, after 6 p.m., this western gradient of that low level jet does tighten just a little bit. And you can see about 25 to 30 knots increasing over 30 knots so as we go to after sunset so if there are some isolated supercell storms maturing at around 6 p.m the low level shear is only going to increase as you go uh, just after sunset so those storms will likely become tornado producers within this environment but when i say residual low level jet the core of the low level jet is lifting through the ohio river valley up into the southern great lakes and this is what's left behind 25 to 30 knots that's why it's more of a conditional threat in addition to the fact that supercell storms may not even develop uh, because of that anticyclonic curvature aloft, uh, this shows that there's also uh, not a very tight gradient, not a very robust low-level jet on the, uh, on the back side of this system. But still, as you go after dark, you decouple those winds a bit from the surface, reduce the mixing, an inertial oscillation takes place, and you get an increase of that low-level jet just above the ground uh, while the surface winds remain relatively weak. And that could lead to some marginally favorable hodographs for severe weather later on today. And this is the latest forecast HRRR pre precipitation at around 0Z, 6 p.m. And uh, this is why the Storm Prediction Center has upgraded to a slight risk uh, because the trusted HRRR is showing convective initiation across northeast Texas and southeastern Oklahoma. And they do look like supercell storms. You've got these. Uh, developing along the front in southeastern Oklahoma. You've got these developing ahead of the front, including in the vicinity of the DFW Metroplex. You've also got some of these developing on the north side of the Texas Piney Woods near the uh, Texarkana area. So you've got a couple different modes of supercell storms that could develop. And in general, the low-level jet axis, or the western gradient of that low-level jet, is roughly in that position, and then it ramps up a little bit to the east. So I'd be more inclined to target these prefrontal renegades across northeast Texas today uh, with this conditional uh, threat. And now I'm going to show you what the shear profiles look like uh, for these storms. And that's, of course, using our, uh, our hodograph, and we'll break down uh, the, the sounding. Here is the HRRR forecast sounding near the Greenville, Texas area at around 6 p.m., 
You've got a subtle elevated mix layer here. That's not surprising considering you've got a lot of westerly winds coming off the Mexican plateau. You get a lot of subsidence up there. That creates the elevated mix layer that moves over top the moisture creating an unstable configuration. Plenty of cape. So once those storms are able to break through this mass down here, they will have plenty of instability to tap into. Wind shear is marginal. You've got 25 to 30 knots out of a southwesterly low level jet there. Over top, some weakening surface winds at about 10 knots after sunset. And that's creating a curved hodograph here. It's not the largest hodograph. In fact, the low level winds do not exceed 30 knots at any point within the lowest three kilometers. And in fact, you don't even exceed 30 knots until you get up above about 500 millibars there. But still, look at that 90 degree critical angle. That's the angle between the storm motion vector with storm motions roughly due west to east at about 25 to 30 knots. Uh, but that storm motion vector creates a near 90 degree angle with that 0 to 1 kilometer or 0 to 500 meter shear vector. Uh, this critical angle here is indicated at uh, 69 degrees, but it's probably going to be a little bit closer to 90 degrees as that low level jet ramps up. I've modified that hodograph just a little bit for a 40 knot low level jet, and that's going to substantially increase the 0 to 1 kilometer storm relative velocity. So if a storm de develops, if you do get a supercell storm, the wind shear is sufficient for an isolated tornado or two. You don't have those low level jets of 50 knots as you often get in Dixie Alley as that upper level storm system is ejecting. That's what we're going to see on Wednesday afternoon across Mississippi, Alabama, southeastern Louisiana and those areas. We're going to see that low level jet in excess of 50 knots creating extreme wind shear and that's why I think there's going to be a tornado outbreak across Dixie Alley on Wednesday. So back to the target area for today across North Texas. This is the area in pink extending into the uh, mountain, mountainous areas of southeastern Oklahoma there, as often happens. I consider East Texas, southeastern Oklahoma, Arkansas, anywhere east of that line I consider Dixie Alley because there is a, a sharp uh, change in the geography right there as well with a transition uh, to more trees. It seems like there's a transition to more rainfall as well with a lot more underbrush. In fact, even alligators can live in southeastern Oklahoma there, as far north as southeastern Oklahoma. So quite a different climate between central Oklahoma and the heart of Tornado Alley, and also southeastern Oklahoma there. Uh, but I do expect uh, storms to develop probably about 5 or 6 p.m. first along that front in southeastern Oklahoma, and then some prefrontal convection uh, to the east of Dallas-Fort Worth. And if those storms do develop, then they will have a chance of an isolated tornado. And that's why it's important to stay tuned to those watches and warnings. I'll be doing radar breakdowns if these storms develop this evening. And then, as I mentioned, I'm going to depart tomorrow for a target area of Dixie Alley. And if you do want to support live briefings like this, I do these every day for the Facebook supporter platform. You can sign up for that. Uh, that supports storm, storm chasing, these live uh, extreme weather updates as well. We do case studies, we do hodograph breakdowns, we're even going to do some meteorology, deriving the vorticity and QG equations eventually, especially during those downtimes. Uh, also consider the Facebook stars, that's what I'm going to use uh, to support the live streams when I head out to Dixie Alley. And uh, thank you so much, uh, the current Facebook supporters, for making these possible. I love talking about severe weather almost as much as chasing it and this gives me a platform uh, to share my target areas, share what I think about uh, where these storms are going to materialize and also share my storm chasing logistics and our team dominator research as we're launching rockets and live streaming sensors into these storms to try to compare the vertical structure between Dixie Alley tornadoes and those tornadoes in, in, uh, in traditional Tornado Alley. So more live briefings uh, to come and uh, definitely stay tuned. I'll likely be doing radar breakdowns as we get closer to sunset and enjoy your Sunday as we have a very active week ahead for severe weather. Never stop chasing.